why is this even important in Minnesota to begin with? You know, number one for us in working with our partners from our other state agencies is safety. You know, each year about 400 Minnesotans die on our roadways. So that's 400 people that can't go home with their families that night. We've, we've seen this trend, a, a, a trend line up here on the graph, and we've kind of plateaued about the last five or six years. Minnesota is actually bucking the national trend in terms of safety. A lot of states are having fatalities go up by 10%, and we're seeing about a 5% decrease, but how are we going to reverse this trend, right? The behaviors are so hard to change with, with people in terms of speeding and distracted driving and impaired driving that we kind of need the technology piece to really help turn that trend. We think that connected autonomous vehicles is really going to help in some of those areas. It's also going to have a huge impact on how our roadways are going to operate in terms of our capacity uh, and our traffic volumes. There's different theories on what's going to actually happen with traffic volumes. Are they going to go up? Because now you have more people that have access to vehicles, for example, the disabled and the elderly who maybe don't drive, now can drive more. There's some people that say, well, no, everybody's going to have a shared vehicle. So you're actually going to have less vehicles on the roadway. So what's actually going to happen with traffic volumes and how are those things going to impact our operations? And a big thing, too, is our infrastructure changes. Right now, we're making some huge investments in Minnesota, and they're great investments, but we're looking at 100-year designs on some of our major bridges. What does our infrastructure look like 100 years from now? What do we need to actually have? We were talking with one of our districts, and they were designing a roadway and had really flat side slopes. And we said, why do you have such flat side slopes, and why are you buying so much right away? Well, 50 years from now, we come and put the unbonded overlay on, then we'll have nice six, to eight, six or eight to one side slopes. You say, 50 years from now, what is our infrastructure going to look like? Do we need to have these wide clear zones? Do we need to have all this other infrastructure out there? So starting to look at today, what can we start looking at today now in terms of our investments is going to really impact uh, what's going to happen in the future. There's also the things that we talked about earlier that Bob talked about is how do you maintain these systems? Uh, one of the questions was, is MnDOT going to maintain and operate all these things? Are we going to be the Wizard of Oz? And we don't know the answer to those questions, but we're starting to think about how does our workforce change? Do we need to have more data management people on? Do I need to have more electrical engineers on staff to, to operate these systems and maintain these systems? So it's much different when you're talking about technology than, than just static uh, infrastructure that's out there. And a big piece is our regulation. Uh, we've been looking at it, I'll, I'll, I'll dive in a little later on about our laws and our regulation, but our laws never, ever, ever contemplated autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles. We're pretty fortunate compared to some states, though. We've actually been looking at our laws, and our laws are actually conducive right now to actually doing some autonomous and connected vehicle uh, testing and operations. Uh, one example is the definition of a, a driver. And the driver says, says it needs to be a person who is in physically control of that vehicle. You dive deeper in the law, the definition of a person is a human, a limited liability company. So you're like, wow, we could actually, by our current laws, actually have a company drive a vehicle in Minnesota. So there's a lot of gray hair on that. There's a lot of questions. Like I said, there's more questions than answers when it comes to some of these things. But looking at our regulation is a big piece, too. How does insurance change? Who's liable? Um, truck platooning is also a big thing. Who's able to get a license 20, 30 years from now? Can my 10-year-old jump in an autonomous vehicle and drive themselves to soccer practice? Maybe. But right now, they can't get a license to do that. So these are all big, big questions that have to happen on a statewide level. And a big thing, too, is public acceptance. Uh, AAA put out a study not too long ago, and it was over 70% of uh, Americans are afraid to ride an autonomous vehicle. So there's a huge public acceptance piece. But yet, a lot of the technology is actually out there right now. We talk about adaptive cruise control and some of those items. They're actually in vehicles right now. Uh, we were just talking with Audi about a week and a half ago, and they're going to have a level three autonomous vehicle on the road, but I think it's 2021. So as you're driving on the freeway, you can take your hands off the steering wheel and this car will be able to change lanes, move back, accelerate, decelerate. You don't have to do anything once you're on the freeway system. You get off the freeway system on local streets, they want you to grab the steering wheel and take control. But it's really, really coming fast. It's not just, about, not just uh, cars, it's also freight. We talked about truck platooning. Uh, California is actually doing some truck platooning demonstrations right now. They're looking at a corridor from their port down to downtown Los Angeles. And they're basically saying, we have so much uh, freight volume on that roadway, we're actually looking at two dedicated lanes just for freight. And they've been looking at truck platooning, they said, you know, with truck platooning, we can actually probably increase our capacity by 50%. So instead of building three lanes, I can probably only build two lanes uh, by using this technology. So these things are actually coming pretty fast. We've actually had vendors that have talked about doing a truck platoon demonstration here in Minnesota. So they are interested in our winter weather climates at the same time. 
It's much more beyond that too. The bottom right is uh, autonomous ground deliveries. This is a little vehicle that uh, I saw uh, at a conference last year. It basically weaves around you on the sidewalk. So you can order something from Amazon. They always talk about the drones flying in. This may be the earlier uh, application of these things. These are happening <coughs> in Washington, D.C. right now. But it's basically, it's like a lock cooler. So the delivery goes in there and it shows up at your house. You enter a code in and out comes your package. So these things are out there right now uh, being tested. Of course, in uh, Minnesota, it's snow and ice and salt. If you go online, you Google a lot of the tests that are occurring out there with autonomous and connected vehicles. What do you see? Bright sunny days, nice Florida weather, nice California weather, Nevada weather. All right, what happens when you get in a snowstorm or a blizzard in Minnesota where your temperatures drop below um, zero? Or they always talk about the sensors on the vehicles. What happens with our vehicles in, in uh, December, January, and February? They're caked with the salt on the outside that your vehicle, and you can't wash your car because it's 20 below, and if I wash my car, it's gonna, the doors are going to freeze shut. So what happens with this technology when you get these winter weather conditions? No one's really tackled this yet. So that's why, as Minnesotans, we need to be interested because as we're starting to set federal law and federal policy and the manufacturers are dealing with the technology, we need to have a state at that table to say, look, don't forget about these certain climates and these certain conditions and how these vehicles will operate. So a little more detail on what's happening in Minnesota. I'm going to talk about some of the regulation that we're looking at right now, some of the tests that we're actually doing. I'm going to talk a little bit about our planning and programming and partnering. Partnering is very, very important with this because we're quickly realizing that no agency can do this alone. We're talking to vehicle manufacturers. We've never talked to vehicle manufacturers before. So different relationships and partnerships that you have. And then a little bit of a follow-up on our connected vehicle project, um, kind of what the Tampa is doing, what's happening here in Minnesota. So one of the things that we looked at is a statewide jurisdictional committee. So we're starting to meet with our state partners. So uh, this involves some very high people up inside these organizations too. So for example, Colonel Langer from the State Patrol is very interested in autonomous and connected vehicles. He sees it as a huge safety benefit moving forward. He's on this panel. Uh, we also have the Minnesota State Council on the, dis on the disabled, uh, Department of Public Safety, both the traffic office and their vehicle regulation office. Uh, MnDOT, uh, Metropolitan Council is on there. And our Depart Department of Commerce, which is dealing with insurance regulations. So this group is looking at where do we fall in terms of our laws? What about somebody wants to come and test an autonomous vehicle here in Minnesota? Is it legal or is it not legal? So we're looking at a two-phase approach. We're looking at short-term and long-term. So short-term right now, our laws are a little bit, yes, we think we can do it, but there's probably some gray in it when it comes to autonomous vehicle testing. When it comes to truck platooning, yes, we think we can do it, but MnDOT would basically have to have an escort rolling lane closure moving down the roadway. Do we want to do that every single time with our laws? So what can we do in the short term to kind of clarify for the industry that, you know, Minnesota is interested in having testing done here in, in, in our climate. We want to make sure that we um, are able to assess the vehicles and have that national influence. We want to make sure that they're safe tests at the same time. So we're looking at potentially two, two bills moving forward, one to kind of clarify the testing environment um, for our partners, uh, for autonomous vehicles, and one to simplify things in the truck platooning thing. So we're not sure where these bills are going to go. They're uh, in very, very draft format. They obviously need to go through the governor's office to get approved. So, But there are things that we're looking at with the statewide jurisdictional committee. At the same time, we're also looking at what are the long-term implications for this. We talk, uh, talked earlier about can that 10-year-old drive that vehicle? Can a disabled person now operate a vehicle? Uh, right now, they're not able to get a license. What happens with insurance regulations? If a crash does happen, who's responsible? The person inside the vehicle, the vehicle manufacturer, the software person who actually has the technology inside the vehicle, all questions that need to be answered moving forward. So that's kind of the goal of what this group is looking at, is more of the, the laws and the impact to operate safely on our system. When I first started getting this too, I, I realized there's a lot of stuff that was happening, a lot of talk, right? So government's interested, MnDOT's interested, we think the cities and counties are interested in what's going to happen with this. Academia, very interested, right? A lot of people are working with academia to move some things forward. We have our industry partners, uh, that's consultants, that's contractors, that's you know, Dave Meslow from 3M is part of our group. So we're, we're talking about a lot of different things on an industry level. And then of course we have our special interest groups. This may be the disabled community or other people. When I first started looking at this, everybody is all over the board. All over the board on this. 
So we started talking about how can we bring people together to talk about this in one area. So Minnesota has a vision kind of moving forward. So if you're not familiar with it, but Minnesota Guy Star is that kind of that think tank is what we have right now to, to, to at least come together as an industry to, to talk about these different items. So if you are, this is one of the, one of the few groups where we actually have all these groups already on a panel. So Guy Star used to be more about ITS technology, and we're actually refocusing that group now. So over the next 18 months, we're actually focusing on how do we move connected autonomous vehicles forward in Minnesota. So it's a great opportunity if you're uh, one of these groups to, to get involved, to learn, to share ideas, to, to brainstorm about what are the challenges and what are the things that we need to work on. So some current MnDOT projects and initiatives, I don't know if you heard, but uh, there's actually a level four autonomous vehicle here in Minnesota. It just arrived about a week or so ago. Uh, it's up at our mineral facility. Uh, we went through a procurement process to, to, um, to bring this vehicle here and I'll kind of go through why we're doing this project and what's going to happen with it. So project goals. We set out on this autonomous vehicle project and we set out six goals. Uh, snow and ice. How does a vehicle operate in a snow and ice condition? Operations. What happens as these vehicles operate on our roadway? We, we did a lot of brainstorming. What should that vehicle be? Should it be just a regular vehicle? Should it be a MnDOT snowplow that we try to automate? Should it be a bus? Should it be something else? We picked the bus because um, it's kind of how a third party would operate on our system versus just a MnDOT vehicle operating on the system. We've learned a lot already about some of the challenges with a third party operating a bus and the vehicle hasn't even uh, driven one mile here in Minnesota yet. Mobility, we want to see how these can actually improve mobility services. Uh, Joel Wolshire from the Council on the Disabled is very interested in this project. They, uh, they see this as a great way to increase those, um, those life functions for, for a lot of individuals around Minnesota. Looking at our infrastructure, what do we need to do in terms of our infrastructure to maintain um, uh, a system that can actually work for everybody who has a, an autonomous vehicle? So what are those investments we need to make in the future and some of those items moving forward? Uh, influence was our fifth one. Uh, right now they are looking at those federal bills both in the House and Senate and this is actually working for Minnesota. We actually have a seat at the table. I was at a meeting last week with ITS America and they're reviewing the state bills both at the U.S. Senate and Minnesota is sitting there with Texas and Michigan and New York and we have that influence to say look don't forget about what happens in these in these states. And the last one is building some partnerships moving forward. Uh, no, no one can do this alone so where can we look for uh, how does Minnesota fit inside this niche of advancing this technology? So Easy Mile is the vendor that we selected through an RFP process. If you're not familiar with Easy Mile, uh, the shuttle is a small electric shuttle. It's a 12 passenger <laughs> shuttle. Ideally, we wanted to get a full-size bus that could operate at freeway speeds. They're not really ready to come to the United States yet, especially in cold weather testing. Um, China does have some that are operating, but the timeline for getting that vehicle through our regulations would have been enormous. So we, we are ending up with an easy mile. Um, it, it operates at a maximum of 25 miles per hour, but it does have that level four technology. So how this vehicle operates is basically kind of a pre-mapped course. So I can't get in right now and say, drive me to Minneapolis. It, it can't do that. It would have to drive that course a couple different times, map it electronically, and then I could get in the vehicle and it could take me to, to Minneapolis. But it has been used a lot around the, a lot around the world but it's not really been used in a cold weather climate during, those, during a winter and snow um, test. Uh, what we found out from our research before we jumped into this project was, yes, they're operating in Norway and Finland, but when it comes to winter weather, they suspend operations. So this will be the first real stress test for these vehicles. So phase one is operating up at Minroad. The vehicle is actually uh, probably right now today getting, getting its course mapped uh, as it's out there. Uh, we're gonna run it through a series of tests uh, it's not just going to be take the vehicle out there and then run around a little bit, but we're actually going to have snow and ice conditions. We're going to be able to create blowing snow. We are going to rent the, um, a snow machine if it doesn't snow, so we can change the, the, the water content to get different weather conditions. Uh, we're going to have the road full of ice, so see how it operates at ice. We're going to cake it with a salt spray. We're really going to stress test it. One of the great things about this product is Easy Mile also has to provide the operator. They're not just providing any operator. They've hired First Transit. And First Transit said, we operate thousands of buses around the world, and we're very, very interested in this technology. So they're not going to just have normal operators, they're actually going to send engineers up to run the vehicle. So as we're designing and finalizing our testing plan, 
their chief engineer for the North American operations was here about two weeks ago, and he said, we have some ideas on how to stress test this thing. Are you open, men not to stress testing it? We said, definitely. So it's, it's, it's going to be some pretty rigorous tests, and we'll see what actually happens with this vehicle in the snow and ice conditions. We also are partnering with 3M on the project. So 3M is also looking at some of the sensor technology and some connected vehicle components. They're still working on the details with Easy Mile right now. That's a separate agreement that they'll have, but um, in addition to an autonomous vehicle, there will be some connected vehicle components too. Uh, then, after it's kind of gone through some tests in December and January, we're going to mobilize it down to the Super Bowl. We're going to operate it on Nicolette Mall on one city block between 3rd and 4th Streets. Uh, it's going to be open to the public, so there's kind of a 10-day series of events leading up to the Super Bowl. So the week before, when it's mostly Minnesota residents in town, we're going to operate the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the weekend before the Super Bowl. And then as the international and national people start to come in, we're going to operate it on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So as part of this, there's a mock-up right there. 3 is providing the custom vehicle wraps for the vehicle. So on one side, it will be a football team from the NFC, and the other side will be a football team from the, from the AFC. Uh, 3M is, they, is providing those wraps. We are in the process right now of getting the host committee to approve the concept. We've met with them multiple times. They're very excited about the project, but we want to get the official NFL blessing so we can use the term Super Bowl and any marketing materials that we do. So I say this is an opportunity for the public to ride the bus. It will be via sign up via website, um, but a great opportunity to, to overcome those fears of the public. Uh, once it's done with Minero, once it's done with the Super Bowl, it will go back up to Minero to finish up some testing from there. And then our contract also has an optional phase three where it may operate other places around the state. So we are talking with 3 about having it going on to their campus, which the cost that they would pay for. Mm -hmm. uh, Hennepin County is interested in operating on, uh, uh, for a week or so, uh, probably in April. We also are talking with the University of Minnesota, uh, Duluth Canal Park, Mayo Clinic, and some MBTA routes. So the vehicle will probably be here through April or so, and possibly longer if these other sites uh, want to have the vehicle also demonstrate. Uh, in addition to the autonomous vehicle piece, we are working on what's kind of called the SPAT challenge, and I won't go into all the details, but this is a way for our signal systems to talk to either the vehicles or pedestrians or bikes. So we are working on a SPAT corridor right now. It's Highway 55. We're kind of in the preliminary planning stages of this project. It uh, goes from downtown Minneapolis out past um, 494. If we have enough funds, we also maybe do some connected technology on I-394 and Highway 7. So some of the things that we're looking at doing is the signal systems will be able to, will be able to broadcast SPAT, so signal phasing and timing. So as you're driving down the roadway in the future, it's going to say, you know, the, red, the light is red right now, but it's going to turn green in six seconds, where there's a pedestrian that's going to cross. One interesting thing that we did when I was out in, uh, at ITS World last week, there's a group that we, uh, we met with, and uh, they actually have, this technology is actually ready to go in vehicles. Uh, they took us out in Montreal, and they put us in one of their cars, and they had a little smartphone on their dash with a little speedometer on it. And as we were driving through the signal systems, it had an area of red and an area of green. And it basically said, if I drive at 22 miles an hour, I'm in the green, I'm going to hit that next, next signal system. And we hit it every single time. Or if it said, you know, if I drive at 35 miles an hour, you're in the red category, you're going to arrive on red. So technology pieces that are already out there that our users can use is, is happening pretty quick. So that SPAC quarter is going to do a couple of those things. It's going to broadcast that message if a vehicle wants to, in the future, read that message and take it in. At the same time, we're also going to be trying to broadcast that through our central server, so not just through the airwaves, but actually through a cloud. So um, if, for example, in that test case, BMW had the technology that they were working on, BMW can just grab that out of the cloud and instrument that inside their vehicles. So it's say it's, that, that project is probably going to be a couple years before it's actually up and running. We should be uh, finishing up the planning stages here by the end of the fiscal year, end of June. Some other things we're looking at doing is uh, how can we actually incorporate this with our maintenance forces? So if there's a maintenance activity going on down the roadway, you can automatically light up one of our changeable message signs and let them know what's happening. Uh, last thing is uh, kind of planning and partnering. We are looking at an autonomous and connected vehicle strategic plan in Minnesota. Uh, we'll probably be issuing an RFP here in the very near future. We're putting the final touches on this, but 
how do we get our arms around around this big this big huge concept? So, for in terms of our strategic plan, it's going to look at a couple different things. What are some short, medium, and long-term applications that we can actually do? We're doing some great stuff right now with the SMAT Challenge and doing some great stuff right now with the autonomous bus, but are we on the right track with these? And where is Minnesota's niche? Where should we be working on different items that can actually move the needle on this going forward? We don't just want to duplicate efforts that are happening around the country, but um, finding ways to move that needle. At the same time, it's also looking at our long-range plan. So when you look at everything that's happening with autonomous and connected vehicles, there's so many different things. It touches so many different areas. But where should we be focusing our efforts as an organization? So our planners are really interested in this piece of the, piece of the pie. So we're going to look at different scenario planning. What happens if BMT goes up? What happens if we don't need clear zones? What happens if this happens or that happens? So we're going to look at all these different scenarios and figure out what are some common themes across those scenarios and then focus our attention on moving those items forward. So it's probably one of the biggest comprehensive um, A, B, C, D strategic plans that are probably put together by a state uh, right now. But in addition, we are partnering with MASTO. MASTO has a group that they're looking at truck platooning and how can we make sure that the platooning laws are somewhat consistent from state to state so we don't have states operating in a vacuum. Uh, Honeywell is interested in doing some autonomous vehicle testing up at our Min Road sites. We're talking with Honeywell. Uh, here data, uh, this is people that actually use the, the data on traffic management. They're interested in our SPAT challenge and how can they actually pull that data out of the signal systems and give that to their customers that they feed. Uh, Colorado DOT has similar risks and similar challenges that we have. So we're working with Colorado DOT. They're actually a partner on our bus project. And they have a few things going on in Colorado, Colorado that we're interested in at the same time. Uh, they have an autonomous truck attenuator vehicle that they're working on, so improving safety that we're uh, visiting. Uh, 3M has been a great partner, both on the autonomous vehicle project. They're also doing some connected vehicle work on mineral separately. Uh, Momentum Station is one of the 10 test sites selected by the US DOT for autonomous vehicle testing. This is out in California near San Francisco. They don't have a cold weather partner. So as they're <coughs> doing all this testing, it's great. But people always ask them, what happens if it rains or it snows or it's icy? And they said, we don't know. So we're looking at developing a partnership with the Go Momentum Station in California, be their winter weather partner. And Interix is similar to here technology. They use a lot of data to, uh, to help owners and uh, others with uh, traffic management. So it's kind of a brief summary of what's happening here in Minnesota. It is an exciting time. There's a lot of stuff going on. But uh, it's really important to get engaged 